So last year I wrote this book on, I've been practicing for, as Janet said, 37 years, and my practice is all rehab. So I, I just try to take injuries and make people stronger. I try to, so I'm basically trying to present to you the, uh, the secrets of doing that, the secrets to keep moving. That's so the book title came out of people saying, you know, how do I keep moving? How do I keep moving? How do I just keep going with life? You know, and, and I just I just lost my mom, but that was the last five years of her life. It's like, mom, we got to keep moving. We got to keep keep going, and uh, and that really until we can't anymore, that has to be our goal. And uh, and w some of the things that I'll talk about, I I they're they're very common sense. You may say that is such common sense. I knew that already. And, but in medicine, you'll leave a doctor's office and there's no common sense of what they say. I just treated a patient the other day who the doctor gave a cortisone shot in an area that didn't even hurt her because an MRI showed that there was a problem there. She didn't come in to get that uh, area treated and, and she had a reaction. She got a bad injury from the shot. So. <laughs> So she came to me for a second opinion, and it's like, but she says, I don't blame the doctor so much as I blame myself. I was not, I did not listen to myself. I knew that was the wrong decision, and I should have known better. I should have said, doctor, no, let's deal with my other problem that I came in here to treat. Let's not deal with So, So if you listen to your, listen to what your body's telling you, Sometimes it, it will, or most of the time, it will tell you the truth. So I practice up at St. Francis Hospital, which is uh, high between Bush and Pine. I'm I'm on the 11th floor. We're we're uh, we're uh, what's called the Center for Sports Medicine. Treat all insurances except maybe some of the HMOs. Uh, but we have we have four podiatrists, uh, eight MDs, six physical therapists a whole dance medicine program. It's a huge place that I'm, I'm lucky to be at. I have an email address w which you can use. Uh, one, they'll, uh, tonight if you think about maybe buying the book, but you, you, know, you, you don't want to make a rash decision, you can always email me and the, uh, the email uh, will give, get you a discount. So. <laughs> But also, if you have a question, I, I, we talked to one gentleman, and he's going to send me the list of his podiatrists from his, because he's in some HMO that I don't treat. And he's going he's to send me the list, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to steer him towards somebody who's good. So, uh, so tonight, the, the, the book, I'll have a book signing after this, and it's $49.95. I have my square if you want to pay a credit card. Uh, but I, t I tell my patients, you know, that get the ebook if you if you like ebook. I I mean I like hard bound books, <laughs> but if you want to test out a book, buy the ebook for four dollars and ninety nine cents, and and see if it's something you you want you want to get. So the library here is kind enough; they have one copy uh, that's a reference and two copies that are circulating of the book and. Uh, I'm sure you could convince Janet to have more coffee. <laughs> or have your library, if you're from Oakland or whatever, <laughs> purchase it. This, this, all, this is my all sales pitch for the night. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're here. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. We're here to talk about sort of general rules on, you know, on getting well and on keeping moving. And feet are very important. I've never once regretted being a podiatrist. I was, I was pre-med in college, decided to go to podiatry school because I liked the podiatrist in our running group, and I've never turned back. And it's just been this wonderful profession that uh, you know, helps people, and, and you get instant gratification. You know, my, my internist never gets instant gratification from me. You know, because He'll go and say, "Okay, Rich, you gotta, you know, take this pill." You know, 
but I get instant gratification every day from my patients saying, hey, you know, this pad helped me, or this, this shoe has helped me, and, and, and that's always really cool. Uh, so one of the secrets of keep moving is to just keep moving. So as simple as that. And I, I've been amazed coming, you know, uh, watching people uh, as they age. You know, you see people at the bus stop moving their arms. I mean, there's a cultural thing, right? You know, but just keep, keep working your body parts. Keep, if you can't run, you bike. If you can't bike, you elliptical. If you can't elliptical, you, you, you uh, uh, swim. Whatever you can do, or you, or you take a yoga class, and maybe you can't do the whole yoga, but you can do part of the yoga. Maybe you can do Pilates. Have a lot of things. Take this body seriously. I think we all should exercise a good hour a day at something. You know, and we, we may have to break that into four 15-minute segments. But an hour a day is like, th there's no excuse for that. And uh, if you're religious, you should also pray an hour a day, but <laughs> I, I won't go there. Uh, and, and this general advice uh, applies to all ages. Um, it's really, really important to take younger people and get them exercising. Uh, the obesity in children now is going skyrocketing. And they're on their video games, or they're la they get iPads when they're two. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing the, the, the distractions they have, and every child should be exercising an hour a day. And that's seven days a week. And, there's <coughs> just, so, and, that, and you can find something they like. You know, uh, both my one one of my sons loved running. The other son loved basketball, and and it just whatever they like. Another kid will like skateboarding. I don't, you know, <laughs> a little dangerous sometimes when they almost run into you. But danger for me, not for them. This is really a cr a crucial slide if you have an injury, because there there are three phases of injuries that we're, we're always dealing with with podiatry. We, there's a time when we, want, we have to immobilize something. There's a time then we have to re-strengthen it. And then, there, and then we allow people to start their exercise again. So there's three sort of natural phases that people go through. The problem with this is that you, you, you may, at this point, flare yourself up and not go back here again. So it's not, it, it, it's, 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 it's like if you've ever, any of you have walked the labyrinth, you know, you walk and you get close to the center and then you, and then two seconds later you're, you're off on another, <laughs> you're, you're like as far away as you were when you started. And, and that can help uh, happen with injuries where you, you have to constantly say, am I, Am I hurting myself because, you know, I, I, was, I was put in a boot, and then I was re-strengthened, and now I'm, I'm running, but it's hurting again. Maybe I should back it off again. And sometimes you have to go two steps forward, you know, one step back, three steps forward, three steps back, but eventually you get to the prize. And, you, and again, that's common sense, but um, I, I have one little story that I want to share with you that just happened a couple of weeks ago. This, and, and I'm not going to pick too much on UC, because, but this man came in to the, my clinic with a p level 10 pain on the bottom of his foot from a nerve. I mean, it was classic nerve pain. He took a step, and, and he said, that's level 10 pain, Rich. So, and for two years, he hadn't, he hadn't been able to walk. And for two years, UCSF, you know, which I love. I'm a cow guy. I love by you. But they they biopsied his nerve. They uh, ran nerve conduction tests, low back tests. Uh, uh, they gave him shots. Um, and for two years, he has not been able to take a step. So he comes into my clinic and he says, "What can you do for me?" You know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't have any of his records. I say, "Okay." 
let's start, let's, 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 let's go back to mobilization. So I, I, I took some pink felt, which is about an eighth inch thick, and I cut a little well out, and I made it like three eighths of an inch. So I made a pad for under his foot to float the area, to off weight the area that hurt. He walked down the hall and he said, this is the first time in two years that I have no pain. Okay, I, did, I don't know what he had. I mean, it could be pretty normal. I didn't help the diagnosis, but I, I, I made big progress on, on him walking. But that's the common sense, like, why weren't they do? I still to this, you know, it's only been two weeks, but like, why, why didn't they treat the foot? <laughs> Why were they just doing diagnostic things? So I, I don't know. A lot of people, so there are athletes that I treat, and there are athletes. And some people run marathons and are not athletes. They have no idea. They're, they're, and, and probably only a quarter of athletes I treat are true athletes. Athletes take care of your body, and that's why we're all here tonight. We want to take care of our body a little bit more, and I hope some, some little point comes through. But So this is a gal who's, who doesn't know the difference between good pain and bad pain, but also doesn't honor her body and, and ignores it. Say, I've got this marathon to run, so I'm going to push through pain so I can, I can do my goal. What kind of athlete is that? I mean, she's not getting paid to do this, right? So and that shouldn't be. The, the, in fact, the professional athletes would never do this. They'd say, huh, uh, I, I'm, I've got a big si uh, contract. I'm not going to do that. So basically, good pain is pain that hurts a little bit, but you can loosen it up. Bad pain is the pain that you've loosened up, but as you've gone for your five-mile walk, at four miles, it starts to hurt you. And then you've got to say, OK, Uber, where's Uber? Or let me at least sit down on this park bench for a half hour. Don't limp home. Any pain, bad pain is pain that you have to limp home with. You know? And we tell coaches of, of young kids, parents will always say, can my son play basketball now? Can my son play on the soccer team? Can he run the cross country? And I say, OK, kids don't have a good concept of good and bad pain, but I say, if you, you're in the stands and the coach is on the bench. If they see that child limping, they're in the bad pain realm. And we've got to stop them. So everybody's got to be uh, honest like that. So, so you want to try to figure out, is this pa pain that I'm feeling having any residual, too? Does it hurt the next day? So sometimes people say, I run and I'm fine. The next five days, I can't walk. And they go, OK, well. OK, then you weren't given any warning, so we've got to like slow you down. We've got to like take your five miles and make it two and a half and see if the same thing happens. If two and a half, half then we go down, we've got to go down to one mile. We've got to find out how they can do their exercise and not have any residual pain. So I'm always dealing with this zero to two pain. You know, medicine about. 15, 20 years ago, I don't know, whatever, started talking about the pain level between 0 and 10. And you're all, forced, <laughs> you're all forced to learn that. And they'll say, what's your pain today? And you're supposed to give them a number. That's, it's like the most ridiculous thing in the world because, well, when I do this, it's level 10. When I stand here, it's 2. You know, it's like, so you have to give them some number. But in general, you know, we want to create an environment, whatever it takes, whether it takes a cast, an orthotic, taping, a pair of shoes that rock, whatever it takes to keep them through their whole cycle of rehab in this zero to two pain level. So zero being no pain and two being mild discomfort. I love these eggs. They're much better than those, you know, <laughs> those, those little smiley faces. You know, and I like this. So what kind of pain gives you, you know, the 10? This is level 10. That's nerve pain. Nerve, if you ever had nerve pain, that's, those are the sufferers of this world. They, they have level 8 to 10 pain consistently. 
If somebody comes in and says, I broke my bone and I have level 10 pain, I go, the broken bone, it has n it, it may be a secondary thing, but it's your nerves that hurt, and we've got to treat your nerves. Uh, they're the ones that are giving you that intense pain. So every injury has the golden rules that we'll work with. Uh, in my book, I, I go through uh, 52 common foot, ankle, and leg. Uh, and please check it out or get the ebook. Uh, and, I, and I go through like the top 10 things that are like, these are things that should happen with your bunion, with your plantar fasciitis, with your ankle sprain. They're, they're common things. There's, there's one injury. Somebody mentioned they have hallux limitus. Forget, was it you? So I have, there's like 20 things I do for hallux limitus. Uh, one of my patients went to Kaiser the other day, and uh, I, who has, she was self-paying to see me, and I gave her all these things. So she went back to Kaiser and said, what can you do for me? And they, they gave her three options, you know, and that was it. That was there. there. So that's, that's one of the reasons I have these recommendations is like, if your doctor is not giving you them, say why. You know, there's like 10 things I know that can help this injury. Uh, I did a, an article like four years ago on plantar fasciitis, which is a real common heel problem. And I went through the literature extensively, and I found 72 treatments that were successful, that, that had a legitimate help for plantar fasciitis. 72 things. So that's why chiropractors can make plantar fasciitis better, podiatrists can make plantar fasciitis better, uh, orthopedists can make plantar fasciitis because there's so many options. But, but you have to give the patient at least five options and, and, and then have plan B and have plan C and have plan <laughs> you have to be able to make it more complicated if you need to. Uh, so what are some of these golden rules? Just, I know this, I hate slides that have a lot of things on it, so I'll just read through the first couple ones, but never push through pain that is sharp and causes limping. We already talked about that, bad pain. Never mask pain with pre-exercise pre drugs, including ibuprofen and aspirin. People tell me all the time, say, yeah, I can run. I, I, I run 10 miles and it hardly hurts. I hurt after, so uh, that's probably not too bad. And I, and I go, well, do you take any anti-inflammatories? They go, oh, yeah, I take, I take eight aspirin before I run. <laughs> or, or not eight aspirin. They won't. They wouldn't do Nobody would do that. Eight ibuprofen before they run, <laughs> which is still really stupid. <laughs> but uh, so there's there, you, you, want to, you want your body to tell you, to give you feedback. If you rob that feedback by numbing your, the body part up, you won't feel it till afterwards, and, and then you could have done yourself some harm. And I have plenty of stories. So everything I tell you is basically the KISS principle. Everything I do, like I have podiatry students come into my practice at times and, that are bored because it's not high tech. There's nothing I do high t tech. <laughs> yes? Could you flash back to the last slide? Okay, so everything I do is uh, uh, the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. I am stupid if I make it too complex. So find simple things. And I, tell, I, tell, I teach podiatry students over at Samuel Merritt Hospital, and I tell them, I say, you're learning all these high-tech things. You're going to know how to do stem cell injections and PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, and you're going to learn the greatest surgical techniques but learn the simple stuff, you know, how to properly stretch, what shoes are good if, you're, if you have a flat foot, you know, uh, how to wean off ibuprofen, you know, just <laughs> so, very simple things. Okay? Okay, cool. So, so but, but also, you know, I'm stupid if I make it too complex when I don't need to, and, and the patient is sharing the blame with me, if they, you know, if they go along with it, or they, I have patients, again, not athletes, they come in, and they, they want me to, the first thing out of their mouth, I want a cortisone shot. 
I have a bad nerve. And I said, why do you want a cortisone shot? That's just going to mass pain. You can get a, you can get weakness of the tissue. Like, can't, can't we try icing first? Can't we send you to physical therapy first? Oh, no, no, I have a tennis match this weekend. And I, I said, no, we can't do cortisone for that. So, uh, <laughs> but... You know, that, that same patient may go to the next doctor who will do, who will do that. Uh, I won't, but <laughs> somebody else will. Uh, you'll always find somebody else who will. This is always humbling. So if you have an injury, the 80-20 rule is so true. You have an injury, and in one month, the injury is 80% better. Okay? So you're feeling good. You've, you've dropped the pain down to zero to two. You're feeling good with it? Okay, I'm going to start running my 10 miles again. Unfortunately, it takes 80 uh, it takes 20 percent of the time to get it 80 percent better, but it takes 80 percent of the time to get the remaining 20 percent. And that is so one month you get 80 percent better, four more months it takes you to get rid of the rest. And you should be it's not just time, it's it's strengthening the tissue. It's continuing to work on the anti-inflammatory regimen. Uh, learning the appropriate stretches, or can I tape it? So there's a lot of other things you can do, but it's, it's a long time. Uh, rehab it takes a while. We all have weak links in our chain. Okay, my mom had two knee replacements. My father-in-law had two hip replacements. People come in who've torn both Achilles tendon or have history of shin splints on both sides or plantar fasciitis on both sides. We all have, unless we have a tremendous fall, you know, that hurts one side, we, we tend to get things that affect our weak links. And, you know, pe people come in for it, we treat it, but I like to take it a step further and say, how can we make this weak link stronger for you? You know, it could be simply l using an orthotic to support their arch. It could be learning how to strengthen their foot because they're, the basic root of the problem is their foot, for them, is weak compared to other people or a tendon, their perineal tendon on the side of their foot. So um, it, that saves so many injuries. I, you know, being a podiatrist for 37 years, I now have patients who have been there for th at least 35 and they come back and say, boy, you know, what you did for me in 1985 is still working in 2017. And that, that is like music to my ears. But we, we, we work with them on not just treating the, that problem, but, but trying to take it another layer uh, uh, to help them, trying to get at, at why they're weak. And so and it all boils down to you listening to your body, you know, what... You don't have to be a hypochondriac, um, even though there's probably a few of you out there. Uh, but it is, really, I tell you, I, my, my favorite story of hypochondriac, and this is why it's bad that I, I have control of this clicker, Janet. Because I said, so this guy Richard, who's my namesake, of course, uh, Richard is a hypochondriac, so I, I get five emails from him before he comes in, like, oh, you know, I have this problem, and and uh, and I've learned to, for about 25 years that I've known Richard, uh, have, have dealt with them. So this one day, he's emailed me five times in the morning while I'm seeing patients. Of course, I haven't emailed him back. <laughs> and, and he was okay with that. So he just said, well, Richard's isn't emailing me back, so I'm going to go up to his office because I've got this swelling in my ankle. doesn't hurt. I just... I'm such a hypochondriac. I know what my ankle looks like, which some of you don't know. <laughs> and, and I know that ankle shouldn't be swollen. So, so he comes up. I just have, on my way to lunch, I pass the front desk, and he's out there seeing, and he's, I'm not going to be coming back for an hour, and he's going he's to wait there for the next day. So I see him out there, and I go, oh, I'm going to have to deal with Richard anyway. So I go out in the waiting room, and I examine him in the waiting room, and I, and I squeeze his calf, and I say, you know, have you been sitting? He goes, oh, I sit a lot. You know, so maybe it just didn't make sense why his left ankle swelled versus his right. It was like a, a sixth sense, like, okay, 
he's a hypochondriac, so I could easily blame, it, blame him being there. I said, Richard, just to rest our minds, we're going to send you down for a Doppler ultrasound and, and make sure you don't have a blood clot in your leg. So for, for the last five years now, when I get an email, sometimes three and four times a day, dear Dr. Blake, comma, the man who saved my life, comma, because he had a blood clot from his knee to his groin that was fragile, and they were able to take him from radiology, send him to the emergency room, get him on a blood thinner, and, and, and that could have, could have saved his life. So every now and then, podiatrists save people's lives. So that was cool. But, you know, I, don't, I still to this day go, I don't know why I sent him. <laughs> to, but something. Okay. In uh, all health classes in high school, if you remember back to your high school or, or, or college health classes, you learned rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Okay. We've, we've only added one, one letter to this thing, and that's price. So we've added the P. So when you get an injury, you have to protect it. So if it's an ankle sprain, you put an ankle brace on it. Uh, you rest it, and, and athletes hate the word rest because it's a four-letter word, so they like activity modification. Uh, you got to ice it for four days. Any new injury, you, you put an ice pack for anywhere from five to 20 minutes based on how deep the injury is. So you got to cool that sucker down for those, for those first four days. And you compress it as best you can with an ace wrap or, or again, a brace. Uh, and, and you do as much elevation as you can. You don't have to get it above your heart, but just keep it propped up. And, keep, and I like also keep, keep your ankle moving. So if it's an ankle for toes and ankles, you keep the ankle moving. Uh, so you're, you're actually starting phase one of, of your strengthening program by, by moving your ankle, getting the circulation going, and that hel helps with it. So price is the, the mnemonic to remember for that. Stretching. Uh, most people should know how to stretch their Achilles tendon and their quads and their hamstrings. Uh, we, we try to, you know, a lot of kids don't need to stretch, but we try to get, just get the habit when I, I coach baseball and basketball for 13 years, and I, you try to get the kids to do the stretching, and they're, you know, they're joking around and behaving a little bit. Um, but, you, but when you stretch, you should hold the stretch. So a kill, like an Achilles stretch, you hold the stretch for 30 seconds. That's, you don't need any more than that, and it probably shouldn't be any less than that. There should never be pain is another principle. So hold for 30 seconds, never be pain. I like to deep breathe, good yoga principle. So instead of, instead of counting to 30, where we tend to hold our breath, take four or five deep breaths and, and let that oxygen get down into that tissue we're trying to stretch out. So, um, uh, and then no bouncing. So you don't want to like, you see people like, oh yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to loosen up and they, they're doing whatever they're doing, they're bouncing with it. So we call that ballistic stretching. And the word ballistic doesn't sound very good, you know, unless, you, unless you're going to do a bomb or something like that. Uh, strengthening. Uh, golden, golden rule of thumb is that you start to strengthen an area as soon as you heard it. <laughs> so day, day one, as soon as you heard it, you start to do something to strengthen it. Even though I said there's a clear phase of immobilization and then re-strengthening and then return to activity, you still try to blend those phases. And as soon as you hurt yourself, you can at least you know, do, if, I, if I sprain my wrist and I can do this without pain, that's active range of motion. That's phase one of rehab, you know, and then I can start adding resistance and do some isometrics. So I can start re-strengthening it as soon as I heard it. Uh, th these are the, the classic uh, definitions of, of the types of strengthening we teach people. So from simply... If, if the only thing you remember is this act, the number one, which is, again, very simple but very effective, is just if you hurt your knee, you try to keep moving your knee. 
And that activates the quads, it activates the hamstrings, but again, it shouldn't hurt. It can, you can't keep making it hurt. But so you try to do pain-free range of motion, then you can add you know, tightening exercises and weights, you can, you can use re resistance bands, and that's usually when you need to go to a physical therapist and they need to outline a program for, for you. I, I hurt my back a few years ago, and I ended up with like 70 back exercises o over a five-month period. In the <laughs> Therapists are good at, at giving you exercises, but they, they never want to take any away. <laughs> So sometimes you have to say, well, I, I only have time for 10. You know, I, uh, you, know you can't do 70, but, but still, you, you can slowly add uh, you know, almost any, any, any body part can be strengthened and, and should be strengthened. This is always controversial. When to ice and when to heat. Okay, I always tell people, air with icing. Okay, some people, if it's a very superficial injury, can't ice more than five minutes. If they ice more than five minutes, they start burning the skin nerves. <laughs> uh, I did that once. Uh, I had to ice my shoulder during the, the uh, uh, O.J. Simpson trial. You know, I watched that every night. I put my ice pack on my shoulder, and, and my, my shoulder was numb for like six months. <laughs> it was just a 20-minute ice pack, but, it, but there's, there's no fat up there. <laughs> so. So I, I anesthetized my nerves myself. So, so any, if you've ever made a mistake, I've made it too. So be, you're, you're in some, some company anyway. Uh, What's the best length of time hurry? to ice? So typically you ice for four straight days with an injury. So an acute injury, you ice for four straight days. But then you ice after you work out to cool things down. Uh, you, uh, people sometimes ice almost indefinitely if they have a chronically sore knee, they have chronic arthritis in their knee. I tell anybody who has arthritis in their big toe or, or anywhere, like, you know, arthritis 101 is putting that ice pack on the body part once a day for five to 10 minutes just to cool the basic inflammation down that the arthritis causes. You will be so much more comfortable overall. Uh, Right, you use it for like, at the big toe, you're like, five, you're talking about five minutes of icing to cool it down. And probably if it's, if it's really bothering you, you want to do it like three times a day, and then it starts to feel better, you cut it down to two times a day, and it starts to feel better. Then you go to your maintenance of just once a day. But uh, it, it really has to be non-painful for a month before you would stop icing. <laughs> Yeah, for a lot of things. That, that would be the heat. So if you wanted, I mean, foot mas I love foot massagers. So if you all want to go out and buy uh, a foot massager, I'm sorry I don't have a patented foot massager <laughs> to sell you. Uh, okay, but I love uh, the massage. It really helps the nerve, uh, the nerve part of, you know, you have three reasons you have pain. You have mechanical pain. You have inflammatory pain, which is the ice is getting out. And then you have the neuropathic pain, which is, nerve pain that settles in and makes tissue hypersensitive and that the massage can help whether it's a vibration or or you're massaging it on a prickly ball or you're or just mas using one, a topical cream to massage into the tissue um, so so typically we ice after activity in a chronic stage we use heat before an activity to warm up and some people when, like when I play basketball, I go to the gym, I start actually shooting around first for about 10 minutes because my t you know, it's like 8 o'clock in the morning and, my, and everything's tight. Then I'll stretch. I'll do my stretches for 15 minutes to, to help loosen myself up. And then, uh, and then I go and, and, and practice, you know, my, my ba play basketball. And then afterwards, if, if something hurts, I'll, I'll go back 
and I'll put the ice pack on. Uh, if you want to speed up the warming process, you can use a heat pack before you work out. So some people say, ah, oh, my hip is always sore. I say, you know, try, you know, one, you try to figure out a stretch for it. That's good. But also try a heating pack before you go work out. You know, uh, if any of you are Golden State Warrior fans, there's got to be one or two of you, when Steph Curry hurt his ankle last year, or hurt his, hurt his knee, I'm sorry, and he came back, he was like on that exercise bike in between, and Kevin Durant in between. Uh, he, he didn't go to the bench to sit down when he was not playing. He was in the tunnel riding the stationary bike to keep his knee loose. And, they, and he probably had a, a heat pack on it too to, to, to loosen it up. There, there's wonderful tape out there now that, we, that I didn't have for a good 25 years of my practice. And, and now it's stretchy tape. It's multicolored, which is really cool. You know, good for San Francisco, right? And uh, it, it's, you, could, you could typically tape any body part to some degree. Uh, some people have to do it chronically. Some people just through the two months of their injury. Learn to tape your big toe if you have hallux limitus, uh, or tape your ankle. This is this is tape for the Achilles tendon that helps the person move them along uh, into the return to activity phase. Uh, and this this is real important. There's three types of of pain. Podiatrists are really good at the mechanical, so we're always using braces, we're using orthotics or wedges to shift body weight around. So we're helping the mechanics of something. If we think your, your foot pronates and we, you, need, you need mechanical support and, and that can help you. It can help your knees and your hips. But there also then can be a secondary inflammatory reaction. So you have to like do, so you can't just give somebody an orthotic and say you're fine. If they, you know, you should add some anti-inflammatory with that. So whether it's whether it's just straight icing or uh, or or doing some some salve or uh, you can you can take ibuprofen, but as long as you don't do it before you work out. Uh, so there's always that, and 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 but then there's a neuropathic pain. So if somebody comes in and says, "Boy, I've had this pain for seven months, and it just hurts all the time," and you you, you feel their tissue, and it's not that swollen. You go, "I don't know why it hurts." Anytime I say, I don't know why it hurts this much, there's always a nerve part to it. It's always the nerve, and the nerve you can't see with, you know, people can have terrible sciatica, and you don't see any body part swollen. So it's always, so, and that, that takes different, you know, you, you can do neural flossing, neuro ease. There's, there's different, different things that, that can help that physical therapy. Yes? It just masks the pain. It's just a, a general principle. You, you know, you, you don't want to mask the, the problem. So if you have to take ibuprofen to be able to work out, there's something going on you know, that you, sh you should deal with. And in, in, in the long run, it will hurt you. Uh, so I think if you take it a couple days, it's fine. <laughs> but uh, in general, it's a, a bad general principle. Uh, Yes. Ibuprofen in high doses cause the stomach and uh, colon problems. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, recently, I had a peripheral neuropathy. Am I able to use that exercise, the new exercise tape? No. For peripheral neuropathy, you can use like neural flossing. So that's uh, that's uh, an exercise for the nerves to help that. Uh, I don't know enough, but sometimes, sometimes the neuropathy is coming from the ankle. The ankle moves too much, so we treat the mechanics of the ankle, and it takes the pressure off the plantar nerves, and they feel a lot better. And some, sometimes you have to go through 20 different supplements, one, a different one every month to see. I, I have a list of about eight supplements in my office that I'll have the B, B12, B6, you know, whatever, and I'll have people go through them like, okay, the month of November, take 
take a, a, the no, a good dose of, of B12, and if that doesn't seem to cut into your symptoms, then in December we're going to do another one. And, and sometimes it takes that. And I, I have people like swear by one different supplement. You know, they, they found the one that worked for them. But if you take them all, you, you have no idea what helped, and, and they probably work against each other a little bit. So it's a, that's a little difficult. Yeah, no. Yeah, so most of it's on my website. So I have a blog uh, that I can write down after. So um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I have a blog. I have I have a YouTube channel. It's Doctor Blake's Healing Soul, uh, and like all my exercises are on there. Uh, if you eat. E if you get my email and you email me, it's actually on my email. Uh, if I give you a response, it will it will have my blog <laughs> information. So a lot of that's on there. And of course, it's all in the book, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. So um, definitely one of the important things I do is watch people walk and run. See, so most people run pretty good. Sometimes their shoe selection is pretty bad. Uh, they get into the some, oh, I've got to wear this shoe with five fingers or something like that. And, and, and there are people that, like, jam their feet against the ground. Some people it's very appropriate for, but sometimes I'm, a lot of times I'm counseling them. Let's just go up a little bit more and cushion and support. And, and, it, and it could be as simple as that that it, it helps them. Uh, but some people run just terrible, and they have to go. We have a physical therapy staff that... Tr will train them to, to run better. I try to give them tips. Sometimes it's purely they, they need some exercises to, to get their muscles working uh, better. So it can be a process to cha change how you run, but it, but it is doable. But it's, I tell people, for the next year, you're going to learn to run again. And they're like, oh, God, what am I getting? <laughs> Maybe they never come back after I tell them that. But, but it takes a while to learn. And you have to, like, telephone pole to telephone pole run. And uh, sometimes they, they run too fast. Sometimes they run too slow, which is interesting. Um, and then another mnemonic I use all the time is for tendonitis. Uh, it's called bris, and it's basically if you have a tendon injury, again, you're working with the biomechanics of, of that tendon and, and why it's, you know, why, does, why are you getting that? You're, you're talking about some form of activity modification, some sort of anti-inflammatory, and then you always with a tendon, you've got to stretch it out and strengthen it. So at least you've got to evaluate for me, so this is my mnemonic that I go through. If somebody comes in with Achilles tendonitis, I go through this and go, okay, what mechanic? What are the mechanics that cause this? Are they simple to correct, or are they are they going to be difficult to correct? Uh, and then, how can we create that zero to two pain level? So, so how can we get this tissue calmed down and uh, and and in a better place so we can return you to running? Uh, that usually requires some form of icing or some anti-inflammatory, and then learning. There are people that are over-flexible, and there are people that are under-flexible. Uh, our, our, uh, most textbooks talk more about if you're too tight. You know, or you're too tight. You have Achilles tendonitis because you're too tight. And, and sometimes people do, I have patients who do five days a week of Bikram yoga. There's no way they're tight. <laughs> they're as loose. They're, they're actually on the other side. Their, their Achilles tendon is so loose that I tell them, I don't want you stretching for, for three months because you're too loose. So that takes a physical therapist or, or somebody to like get a handle on you know, what's going on with you. And, and then always strength training. So I love uh, dealing with swelling. Swelling is like a key to so many injuries or so many uh, rehabs. Because all people come in and their ankle is chronically swollen and they're really not addressing it. They may have gotten a brace. They may have 
gotten a pair of orthotics. They may be on a strengthening program. All good things, but no one's working on their, on their uh, swelling. And swelling floats the joint. Wherever that swelling is, it's bad for the joint. The, the tendons have a hard time stabilizing the joint. Uh, the, the swelling joint, uh, uh, floats the joint surface and makes you more unstable. And I, I had this one guy in recently who sprained his ankle a year ago, and that was the first time, and has sprained it like four times since. And he's been doing all the right stuff, but I looked down at his ankle, and I said, I said, this has been a year, and why is your ankle so much, so swollen? So we had to, like, he had to do hot and cold baths twice a day and wear a compressive sleeve, and that really started to change his symptoms. And I, and I really wanted him to go to acupuncture, I, I offer people, I say, for swelling, either acupuncture or physical therapy, whichever you want. Uh, at least we want to go like eight times and to have them get rid of that swelling and that tissue. And, th and those professions are, are usually really good. So usually there's an ad for the Warriors uh, last year of uh, Igodala laying in an ice bath. And soaking is the best way of working on swelling or sore. So if, so feet are so easy. You know, you don't have to put your whole body in the toilet. You can just put your foot, right? <laughs> so feet are easy, but some, and elbows are okay, hands are okay. And it's hard to, hard to like get our backs and stuff like that. But if you can soak something, whether you're using ice or heat, you're, you're going to really help yourself. Um, again, I talked about nerves and how nerves cause so this is a, a simple little problem with a nerve. Uh, this, this was, I think this is the guy I, I told you about that had this two years of nerve pain. I bet he has a fairly simple problem. The MR, unfortunately, the MRI didn't show anything, which means it's probably even simpler. But because the MRI didn't document anything, there was no reason for them to do surgery to remove it. So it started this two-year process of, of of treatment until all my pink pads came in. So, but nerve pain, if you have nerve pain in your foot, you hurt, you know, th th those things really hurt. Well, a third of people, so if you have nerve pain in your foot, a third of people are just numb, and they think they have peripheral neuropathy. They're just numb. Another third of people ha have just pain, and, and then the other third get a, a mixture of pain and numbness. So they're, they're the in-between people. But it's the people who just have pain who've described to me. I said, well, how can you describe that pain? And I'll say, well, if you've ever been to Hawaii, it's like somebody pouring lava onto my foot. <laughs> so you'll get, you'll get things like that. And, and if you can help somebody with symptoms like that, you feel pretty good as a podiatrist. <laughs> if you can't, you feel really frustrated. <laughs> so. So that's the, so with nerve pain, this is the you know they, they, they come in with this pain. Nothing else causes pain like this unless you have a bone sticking out of your foot. And I think you could all, you know, even without this lecture, you probably could figure that out. You know. So there there's a syndrome, and I, I get the most YouTube hits on this. I wrote a little blog, a little YouTube video on how foot pain can come from your back. And the, the sciatic nerve comes down the back of your leg through your, through your calf and then goes in both in the bottom and in the top of your foot. And, and you don't have to have back pain for a little bulging disc at your back to cause you to have foot pain that, that is a level 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 pain. And, but... There's no problem at the foot. It's just the end of the nerve that, that's hurting, and the problem's coming from your back. My, one of my very interesting uh, patients is a friend of mine. Uh, ten years ago, Tad came in. Tad hates doctors. So Tad told me, he goes, I'm only seeing you because you're my friend. I hate doctors. And I have level 10 pain from an ingrown toenail. That was his chief complaint that the nurse wrote down. Level 10 pain, ingrown to in toenail. And I'm a podiatrist, so Tad was in the right place. 
So I poke on his foot. There's, there's no swelling. He doesn't have an ingrown toenail. I said, Tad, this has got to be double crush. You're, you're irritating the nerve in your back, and you're irritating the nerve at your foot you know, by stepping on it, and, and it's the end of that nerve that's hurting you. And, and he, he looked at me like, you're crazy. And, and then I said, you have to go to a back doctor. And he goes, I hate doctors. But okay, you're my friend. I will go to the back doctor. The back doctor ag initially agreed with me and said, yeah, it's probably coming from his back. Let's get an MRI. Tad had stage four prostate cancer. There was a, a metastasis pushing on the nerve. Uh, pardon me? <laughs> so Tad got, 10 years later, I, I, I actually treated his uh, daughter last year, and as of nine years, Tad was doing great. The, the, uh, but it presented, uh, you know, so Tad calls me, being my friend, he goes, you're wrong, Blake. So guys use their last name, right? Blake, you're wrong. I go, what was I wrong? It's not my back. And I go, well, what was it? He goes, I have, I have terminal cancer and I'm dying. <laughs> so, luckily he didn't. So, so this is the exercise I have on the on the, the YouTube for neural flossing. So if you have, this is a wonderful exercise. There there are many versions of neural flossing. This is my wife, who's back there, and uh, she, uh, she's uh, she's taking her foot through. We're we're trapping the spine and the and the pelvis down, and we're taking the foot through the range of motion to help relax the nerves. She does, you, you would do that like three times a day uh, to, to help an, a nerve heal. Um, if, if anyone's told they have a bone problem, a stress fracture, a bone bruise, vitamin D can be the culprit. And, and this is a public announcement because you know, through the, the public health, right? <laughs> There's such a vitamin D deficiency in our, in our uh, population. And so if you have any knee pain, hip pain, joint pains, your bones ache, get a bone density if you haven't had one in five plus years and get a vitamin D blood test and see where you're at. I mean, I just had somebody who's 27 years old who has the bones, he's Middle Eastern, so there could be a cultural thing. But he has the bones of a 95-year-old. And I, and I told him, I said, Ari, we, it's going to take us a good 10 years to work through. And he's been to now three endocrinologists. And we're, we're working him through his. But he, he presented with shin pain. And I said, well, he said he had shin pain for two years, been worked up at Stanford. Uh, so I'll pick on Stanford now. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, Shin splints don't act like this. Let's let's see what your bone is. So we got a bone. We got the bone density first, and it, he was so bad. So those are. He is so thankful because he's 27 and he can not have a crippling spine, you know, that's falling apart when he's 60, you know, because because he'll have plenty of time. Yes. Pardon me. No bone spurs actually you probably have. More bone than you, you want. <laughs> or not really, but you know, bone spurs would not be a symptom of, of poor bone density. Uh, and, and then if, you, yes? Uh, I've heard that uh, sunlight on their, around their neck and top of their arms is very important uh, for uh, if stay away from cat, to keep away from cancer. And I've been making an effort to do it. I used to do what a lot of people do, want to cover my whole arm. Yes. And I look around and I see, oh, they have this way covered, this way, all different ways of covering it up. And here I am, I'm trying to get, get the sunlight yeah. uh, on the top yeah. of my uh, the, 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 the AMA will, thank you, wonderful point. The AMA will go as far as this. They'll say, 15 minutes twice a day between 9 and 9.15 and between 3.30 and quarter to 4, you know, having your arms exposed <laughs> is safe for your skin and it gets enough vitamin D into your body. <laughs> but still, 
with that little bit of exposure, we still have a, a huge epidemic in our country of, of, of vitamin D deficiency. So, do you have vitamin D deficiency? Okay. Pardon me? Yeah, we, so, so we're not getting enough sun, and then, or, or we're covering our, fog. pardon me? San Francisco fog. Yeah, I don't know the, I'm not a dermatologist, so I don't know the answer, like, can't we, even with fog, can't we get the, shouldn't we? There's a nurse here, that she, we, we, okay, but I would think even with San Francisco fog, we should be able to, but I, that I, that I don't know, it's, it's an interesting, what? Yes, then you should be able to get vitamin D. Okay, <laughs> and we don't have any. We don't have too much fog anymore with global warming. That Donald Trump won't agree with. Yes. The only source of vitamin D is sun. Pardon me? No, the only source of vitamin D. Is no, no, it's the, you can you can get it in a lot of food. So Excellent. you know, milk. You know, you can you can get it through supplementation, for sure. So yeah, a lot of people will take. Take 400 milligrams of, of 400 uh, units of vitamin D a day, and that's all they they need. If you're low, I have people taking 7,000 units. Like my patient Ari, he's taking right now 7,000 units a day. Actually, 50,000 units a week uh, to now get you know get the, his his vitamin D up. He was like. Our, our range is like 32 to, to 80. It's a huge range for normal. He was like six, you know, and then his bone density was so bad. So um, if you have a bone problem, think about a bone uh, stimulator. A lot of insurances don't cover it. Sometimes they're 500 bucks, you know, if you self-pay. There are websites out there that you, you can get them for 400 or something. But there's a lot of injuries out there that need a bone stimulator. And, and now they are so sweet. This Exogen 4000 sounds like a Harry Potter broom or something. The Exogen 4000, you know, for, for some, uh, what is it, Quidditch? For, uh, but uh, um, you, you, you apply it to your skin above the fracture 20 minutes twice a day. And that's it. Pardon me? So this is an ultrasound. So this came out about 15 years ago, and they use ultrasound to hit the cells of the bone to stimulate the bones to have an orgy in there. That's the way I look at it. They have a wild party. They get really stimulated, and then they make new bone. Uh, uh, I don't. I I know it increases circulation, so. I don't see why it wouldn't work on the tendons, but it's not, you know, it's not designed for that. Yes. Uh, if you have osteoporosis, you'd have to, it would be, you'd use it when you have the fracture because cause if not, you'd be moving it around and it would burn out the battery every two weeks and you'd have to... <laughs> Spend a lot, so, um, and then there's the old traditional way uh, that you know with with casts and and crutches. So, again, we wanna with any injury, you gotta create that zero to two pain level. So, however it is, so so many people go, well, I'm I'm through with the crutches. I'm fine. I don't need the crutches anymore. What's your pain level? Seven, six, like. No, you got to go back. If 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 the crutches were the or the cast was the only thing that brought you to zero to two, we got to figure something else out. Maybe we're missing the diagnosis. Maybe we're doing you know doing something else. Um, now I've got a few more slides on on injuries here. Uh, just but but they're also basically principles. In the in the 1700s, the French were revolutionizing the world in two ways. One, they were revolutionizing the world, and two, they came out with this off-weight-bearing pad, which was the first described, to put the weight on another area. So you take the weight off the big toe, and you put it on another area. I use that principle every day. 
you know, many, many times a day. Somebody, somebody comes in and they hurt one spot and I try to put weight in an area that, that doesn't hurt and that, that can bring their pain level way down. So this was, we call it, a, it's called different names, but we call it a dancer's pad to honor the French because they were, we think they're the first to describe a dancer's pad. Uh, for bunions, 101 for bunions. I, podiatrists don't do this. I'm like, I'm like totally shocked at my profession. Anybody with a bunion should have a toe separator. They cost two bucks, you know? And they keep the toe while you're walking. It's for walking in shoes. They keep the toe in proper alignment. And, and they should at least three or four times a week for 30 minutes wear their yoga toes. Yoga Toes is an online product, although I've seen Walgreens and Bed Bath & Beyond have knockoffs. But you stretch all those toes out and get them in proper form. So those are like two like really crucial things that anybody with a bunion should be using. Can you wear the yoga toes in the ambulance? No, they're, you know, a podiatrist, they, they're a great question. I, w you know, I always wish that. I said, oh, I wish people could walk around with these things. So I, I actually would recommend people get those Vibram Five Finger shoes if they had it, and like see if they could wear it. That I, I say go to the store and walk around because they're very expensive, and they're not really padded and, and everything. And that was sort of a hit and miss. And then a podiatrist in Oregon, uh, who only sells it through his office website, uh, designed something called uh, Correct Toes, and it's basically yoga toes for walking. And, but you have to wear wide shoes. So he gives you the list of like 10 shoes that, you, that like Keens or, or uh, Ultra, you know, uh, Olympus type shoes. So, so there's like, there's only, you can wear them in your slippers at home, of course. But, uh, but those, those do work. I, I, I love that concept. Uh, so t a lot of times we, with foot injuries, like, like Morton's aroma, People will tell me with Morton's aroma, I have to take my shoe off and I have to massage it and it feels so good. And you just add that as part of their treatment. You try to get them to get in there or have their spouse or partner like, you know, get in and, and open up those bones. You know, not, it should never hurt, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. you know, hopefully your spouse isn't, isn't like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, you know, but, but you, you want to like loosen that tissue up in your foot and Again, if you just listen to your body, don't push if it hurts. It, it tends to help, per, you know, the, these nerves, the nerves that run through the foot can get trapped down between the bones. And that, this is really helpful at, at getting the, uh, the nerves to flow through the foot. I, I had a podiatrist call me like 20 years ago, and, he's, and he said, Rich, are you still... Uh, taking neuromas out, and I was still doing surgery. And I said, yeah, we do them all the time. And he goes, but you know, uh, my office is right next to a chiropractor, and I've been sending all my neuromas to him. And, and, and I'm, I'm doing like one neuroma surgery a year. You know, like, it's like going way down, like, a high, you know, like almost 99%, just by getting the chiropractor to get in there. And so we started recommending that at, to the patients or to if they go to physical therapy. And, and I've seen like huge results from that too. This is another, so if you have a, a broken metatarsal, so the metatarsals is, are things that you walk on or you push off from. So we're always designing like orthotics to support the whole area. And then we've got to have an off weight bearing pad. So here we're trying to put the weight around where that bone hits the ground and off it. And you can do this with, with your shoes. You can take an old insert out of your shoe and mark the sore area with, with lipstick, you know, and then put your foot in the shoe and wiggle it around, do the, do the twist, and, and find out where that spot comes on, and then cut a hole out. You'll be amazed. It's, it's like my, my patient with the, with the nerve pain. It's like, you'll be amazed. You, you can, like, take apart old shoes that are just, now that they're your gardening shoes or whatever. You're, uh, so you, you try to like just off-weight it a little bit, and that can give you good results. Um, 
If you have hammer toes, the yoga toes works good. You, you wanna, if, if your toes are crooked, you want to stretch them out. It's really simple. You know, and that, it works pretty good. You try to take each toe. It's a good 30 seconds on each toe. You just try to straight, <laughs> straighten each one out. When you first do it, if you haven't, if they've, they've had 60 or 70 years to tighten up, it's going to be a little painful. So you got to like go easy with them at first. But you can start to stretch these toes out. And then if it's really painful, there's a splint. Uh, we sell it over at our, our hospital has a sports shop that sells these. But you, you, and you can get them online. They're called boot and splints. And they're designed to limit the motion of the toe. Sometimes hammer toes pop up and the metatarsal underneath it hurts. And, the, and people need to have uh, the, the boot and splint. It loops over the toe and then has a pad underneath to keep the toe a little still. Um, not too glamorous, but, you know, athletes get athlete's foot. The athlete's feet, you know, which is a fungus, or sometimes it's a yeast, or Canada, or a lot of different things. They can attack the toenails and give you athlete's foot. I start really simple. I tell people it's going to take you a year, and the minimum is twice a week they do white vinegar soaks, two, uh, uh, two parts water, warm water, two parts white vinegar, and, and they do a 30-minute soak, and then Every night they, they, you know, they get some tea tree oil, which is cooking oil. That's 100% antifungal. And they apply that to the top of their foot or you know, all around. So th and that prevents recontamination. So here you're trying to get rid of it with the vinegar, but then it gets recontaminated. So, you're, you know, you're so the tea tree oil is for the recontamination. Yes? It's 100% antifungal. No, but like cooking oil? Yes, yeah, cooking oil. Uh, you can get a whole thing at. Well, it's called it's called tea tree oil, so it's a certain type. So I'm not a cook, so I don't know what would you cook with tea tree oil. Does anybody know? Okay, you've learned one thing. I can stop now. Everybody's <laughs> learned one thing tonight. <laughs> okay, so I I I. You know, I was up at Whole Foods on California and what Franklin the other day, and they and I saw a, a bottle of tea tree oil. So I, I know it's in the, it's probably Rainbow, but Rainbow is near us. You know, so check check out the cooking oil. Look for tea tree oil. It's one hundred percent. I I learn everything or mo uh, most things from my patients. You you learn in medical school. You learn some things. You learn some basic things, and then. <laughs> And then you have to treat patients. So the patients come back and say, oh, what you did didn't work, but what I did worked. And I say, well, what did you do? And they tell me. And that's how you, after 37 years, you develop how you're practicing then. You're like, so one of my patients who I gave, gave them a medicine to apply to their nail twice a day, it was 8% tea tree oil was the active ingredient. So, so that patient came to me, and I, I remember the day. She goes, you know, you gave me something that's eight percent. Why can't I just use a hundred percent? And I go, oh, <laughs> that's smart. <laughs> so, but that's how you learn. <laughs> so, anyway. Another thing. Yeah. Sunshine on feet. I find that if I have something kind of fungal-like, if I get two times out in the sunshine for maybe half an hour, it goes away. But the sunshine on your yes. 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 Very, very good point. So, well, what I write in the book, and and basically, you want to change the environment. So, so vinegar is five percent acid. It's and it dries. Sunshine dries. Feet. You know, some some of us are really sweaty in our feet, and they apologize to me when they take off their shoe in my office. Go. I'm sorry I made a 4 o'clock appointment. I should have made a, an 8 o'clock in the morning appointment because my feet really swell, uh, sweat. So, but anything to change the environment. So you want to you dry it out, uh, foot powder in the shoe, a little sun exposure to get your vitamin D. Boy, we're, we're, we're set. Right? <laughs> so, but that, that's great. 
If you have swelling on top of your feet, you should get an MRI or CT scan. Right in the middle of your instep, people come in and say, boy, my foot really swells there and it hurts. And, and typically, that's where their weakest link in their chain is. They have some weakness in the arch. And this is, these are supposed to be really solid bones. And if you don't know what an MRI looks, it looks like Swiss cheese in there. So they have some arthritis developing it. You usually can ice them, you know, have them ice, uh, have them uh, uh, use an orthotic to support the area, get stronger in their foot, and, and a lot of this can go away, or a lot of their symptoms. It, but it, anytime you have arthritis, it could just be a maintenance program. But you can maintain your body in in a much happier place. People say, oh, I don't want to do a maintenance problem, but then you'll be able to walk more, you'll be able to, you know, do, do more hiking or whatever. So, so, of course, podiatrists, we make our living on arch pain. We're making, we make orthotics for people. We tape them, we strengthen them. But the big, you know, probably the biggest lesson is, and, and Janet wanted me to remind you, one of the most important exercises to do and I learned this when I hurt my ankle, I learned this when I hurt my knee, I learned this when I hurt my back, is, is single leg balancing. You get in a door well, and you, and you bend your knee a little bit to protect your knee, and you try to balance for two minutes on each foot. People will give up on that. I, I cannot believe, like this is so good for your knee, it's so good for your core, you try to stay centered, and you try to balance there. And, and when you get really good, you can stand in the middle of a soft pillow. But people say, I, I can only do 15 seconds. And I hold on and I say, well, you're still doing the two minutes. No, and I stop after 15 seconds. I say, no, you got to. It's a learned task. You can learn. There was a study done in 1968 in London who showed that if the patients could learn to single leg balance for two minutes without falling over, they didn't need ankle surgery. And these are people, it was like 80% of people, so they, had, they took a group experimentally, and they said, and they put this whole group on a rehab program. The 80% that could do a single leg balance after six months did not need the surgery. And, and the 20% who failed had their ankle re, re, uh, you know, uh, uh, reconstructed. So, you know, and that was like, early days of sports medicine, but literature was coming out like that. And now we know so much more about trying to strengthen body parts. Uh, if you have heel pain or plantar fasciitis, learning this simple stretch is really important. You, you put your toes up on the wall. You should do it with shoes on because you're going to bend your toes. So the toes go up the wall. So I'm, I'm coming up the wall here. And then, and then you pull your knee forward, and you, you, you'll, you'll feel a stretch all through the arch and on the lower part of the Achilles. If you feel the upper part of the Achilles, you're really tight. Because <laughs> so this, this one should feel all like in that plantar fascia under the foot and the lower, lower part of the Achilles tendon. So That's called a plantar wall stretch. Uh, yes, on, on something that doesn't move. So I put my foot up on the wall, and then I drive my knee towards the wall, and I hold it again for five deep breaths, practice all my good principles of stretching. No, there shouldn't be any pain. I'm not jerking, bouncing around. So, so. That's a run. We, if, if, you, if, a stre if you're supposed to do a stretch, you want to do that three or four times a day to help limber that up. Because you want to get to 100. My, my mantra with stretching we want to get to 100 stretches as fast as possible. So if a stretch, if somebody, somebody says, they, you know, I'll see people a month later, so it's 30 days. I'll say, have you been doing your stretching? Yeah, I do it once a day. I've done it maybe 15 times. So, they, so in a month, they've done it 15 times, and they're a little better. You know, so why shouldn't they do it five times a day for that, th that th or four times a day for the 30 days? They'll get 120 stretches in. And they should feel a, a ton better. So, you recommend two minutes on that? Even? 30 seconds. All stretches about 30, 30 seconds. And, and if it hurts, you back off it. Uh, 
a clog or a wedge is like, you know, vital for, for heel pain because you want to push the weight forward. Again, the biomechanics. Mechani we're just trying to mechanically off-weight the heel and shift the weight forward. So m women have an easier time, you know, but, and, and men don't. You know, they're all in flat shoes. And so, so with men, sometimes I have to, I have to design a, like a, a, a shimmy for their shoe. But I, I, I've had guys who, who are fine with their cowboy boots. They, you know, and they'll, they'll wear their cowboy boots around. Or at least around the house, they'll, they'll, they'll get a clog that they'll wear. And, and most of the time, that helps heal pain. Uh, I love Crocs. I don't know if you, any of you have worn Crocs, but there, there are some... Crocs are like big jellyfish <laughs> that you get to stand on. <laughs> They're just so soft. So if, if you, it should be like a diagnostic thing. I mean, if somebody goes to a store and they put on the Crocs and they say, I have no foot pain, then you know shock absorption is, is part of their problem. Or if they put on a, a little heel and it, it takes care of their pain, it's, to me, it's all diagnostically. You know, it helps me learn what they have going. But here's a patient who left his Crocs to walk in the soft sand because their heel hurt from a bruise. You know, so a, l a lot of times people have pain under their heel, and the heel's just been bruised, and, and they can't walk barefoot around the house. That hurts, and it's really frustrating to them. So I say, get a slipper for around the house. Definitely don't wear your outdoor shoes inside the shoe, inside the house. But, uh, you know, and try, try to soften it up. And then, you, and then I have them get a, uh, a plastic bottle. They fill it halfway full of water and then freeze it. So they've got this solid block of ice. And then they, from a standing position, they roll on it. So they, they actually, trying to, you're trying to push that bruised tissue out of there. So that frozen sport bottle routine is really a good way. You're icing to cool it down, but you're also mechanically massaging it to move the tissue. And you can use it to the front of your foot also if you have pain up there. If you have pain in the heel and it's not improving, you should get an MRI. I mean, every insurance company covers MRIs that I know of. And it's amazing. Doctors say, oh, well, you don't need an MRI. Well, if you've had pain for two or three or four months and like it's not going away, why don't get an MRI? It may give us some more information on, on the tissue. Here's somebody who, after seven months of limping around, thinking he just had plantar fasciitis, we did an MRI and he had torn the plantar fascia. So now he has another diagnosis. He has a plantar fascial tear. You have to put him in a removable boot for three months, and he was fine. I had one guy who came in and said, Rich, I've had 10 years of plantar fasciitis. And I go, no, no one has 10 years of plantar fasciitis. It's an, it's an inflammation. It gets better, it gets worse. But uh, and he goes, I've had 10 years of plantar fasciitis in my right foot. We did an MRI. 10 years ago, he had completely torn his plantar fascia, and it had scarred in. You can tell because the, the plantar fascia should be about 3 millimeters where it attaches, and his was about 9. So his had torn and then scarred in. So he had this, but because he kept walking on it, it was still fragile. So I said, we're not going to do surgery to thin that scar tissue out. Let's just try to put you at square one. We'll go back to the immobilization phase. We're going to put you in the cast. And, and sure enough, he, w with, he was a still a little sore at three months, but by five months, he was totally fine. And so, uh, so, some, so I love MRIs. I, I, I order MRIs on <laughs> anything that walks almost, you know, if I can. If, if I think it'll give me, give me some more information. Insurance companies, of course, are hating me more and more. They, you know, I, I have to, like, I have to get an x-ray when I don't think an x-ray will tell just to have the insurance company approve an MRI. Like, oh, do I really? <laughs> MRI is about five hundred dollars if you self-pay for it. You know, my my uh, St. Francis charges two thousand. I just had one. My insurance paid eighteen hundred, <laughs> so I was fine with it. I had to pay two hundred for my deductible. So, so.
Uh, but once, once I, when I hurt my back, no, it was hurt when I hurt my knee, I'm sorry. I hurt my knee, and I called down to St. Francis. It was like 4.30 in the afternoon. I said, can you do my M- an MRI on my knee? And he said, well, we can't do it till tomorrow. So I called another place, and, and I hadn't met my deductible, so I was going to have to pay the whole thing at St. Francis, which is going to be like $1,800 or $2,000. So I called another place. I said, can I self-pay? Can you do it today? And they said, yes. And I said, can I self-pay? And they said, yeah, it's $525. So I, so I just saved $1,300. And I had torn a meniscus. I, I sort of knew I had torn a meniscus in my knee. But um, anyway, sometimes you play with the game. With, uh, so when you sprain your ankle, you know, some sore, again, you sprain your ankle, we got to do price. We've got to protect it, right? We've got to ice. I mean, we've got to rest. We've got to ice. We've got to compression. Well, the, the brace serves as compression. And then I've got to have this young lady do her ankle pumps and her elevation. Yes? I think just making the knee uh-huh. well, Good question. So at St. Francis, I am proud to say that we, we have, like, been so anti-meniscal surgery for decades for like since I was here. Our, our, the doctor who founded us, Dr. Garrick, did not believe in meniscal tears unless they locked on you. If, they, if you couldn't bend your knee and the, and the meniscus had flapped on itself, and, and you're, then you have to have it removed. But he would just, basically I strengthened my knee. You know, I, first I wore a brace to stop. The, you know, I slowly worked through the rehab. First, I immobilized it. Then I started to re-strength. Rehab. What? Went to rehab. Went to rehab. They taught me exercises. I did my... The brace. Brace. My, I, I did icing for anti-inflammatory. You did icing? What else? Uh, I stretched my quad, stretched my hamstrings. So I stretched those muscles. I really worked on developing really good quads as best I could. Uh, and time. Within three months, uh, our son, I did this three and a half months before my son was getting married on Hawaii I- on a beach. And, and so well, one that I didn't want to be recovering from surgery. And I also had to promise my wife that I wouldn't run before that. But I, I felt pretty good by, by even two and a half months afterwards. So it was the back corner of my meniscus. So when I bend it really severely, like when I I kneel in church, (laughs) so sometimes I'll stand in the back, you know, or or sometimes when I'm gardening and pulling those dreadful weeds, you know, out, it'll hurt. But but I can avoid that mechanical pain, and and again, I can can do my basketball, so I'm fine. (laughs) If I can do my basketball, life is good. and then you really want to, you really want to, uh, uh, again, ankle sprains, you've got to strengthen them. Do your balancing. Yeah. And uh, almost, almost done here. There is one really severe problem. It's the number one surgical problem I treat. And, uh, and I don't do surgery, but, but I'm referring to the surgeon. And that's people who come in the office and say, you know, Rich, Three weeks ago or a month ago, my left arch collapsed or my right arch collapsed. And they've, they've lost a tendon. So they've actually torn. So we get an MRI. We document they've torn the tendon. If, if it's still attached, we can try to rehab them. But it's, it's a good year and a brace, and it's a lot of things. So I always have the surgeon because it could go to surgery. And I, I'd say 50% of them at least have surgery. They go in and they have to sew back the tendon, and, you know, and immediately get the get it back into position. So that you would know if that happened to you, where your arch, your arch just collapsed in. That's not a simple thing. When you start to see toes going, like your toe all of a sudden sticks up in the air, or <laughs> so, something weird, or your arch is collapsed, and you you know it's surgery. When you, when we're dealing with Achilles pain. Um, we, since the sciatic nerve, again, our double crush, runs right down through, this, through the Achilles, we have to make sure it's not a nerve problem. 
I, I have patients all the time who come and say, I've hurt my Achilles. It feels, it feels like it's going to tear on me, which is what we call neural tension. The nerves can feel like that, where they feel like they're going to just tear on you. And so if they can go through a regular Achilles stretch, heel on the ground, you know, five deep breaths, and they feel better, it's not a nerve. But if they, if they start doing it and say, oh, every time I stretch, it kills me, then they don't have an Achilles problem. They, they probably have a, a, a sciatic nerve issue. Uh, another thing, when I got into practice, everybody who tore their Achilles tendon, you hope, probably you all know somebody in, in, in your, in your uh, group of friends who's done this, uh, we, everybody had surgery. And then there was, a, there was a, um, an organization which you may have heard of. It's called Kaiser Northern California. <laughs> okay. So Kaiser was so popular that they, and they don't want to do surgery if they don't have to. And, I mean, they'll do, they do a lot of surgery, but if they don't have to. Well, Kaiser Northern California, who was training the majority of, of podiatry residents, they said, you know, let's see if these things heal without surgery. We put them in a boot. We still rehab them. You know, it takes six months or so to go through the whole process. And sure enough, 99% of them healed. And you, would, you knew after two months if they, were, if they should have surgery or not. And so um, anyway, the that's been the protocol probably over the last 25 years. If the patient can, can have the, the patient, if the patient can have the patients to undergo really up to a year, I tell them it's probably going to take you a year to totally rehab this, but we can do this without surgery. The reason with Achilles you want to try to go without surgery is, is because the, the complications are terrible. You get a nerve entrapment, you get chronic healing. It's really poor blood supply in the, in the Achilles tendon. Uh, some of them don't heal very well. Uh, or they, and so if you can avoid, avoid it after a year, you're, you're equal to the people who've had surgery without complications. So that's been about 25 years coming. And we owe that to Kaiser. So. Oh, yeah, sorry. So here's the heel bone, and the foot goes here. The toes are wiggling the other way. Okay. And then, so the Achilles is, <laughs> the Achilles, sorry, not a great sign. But it's, <laughs> but it's all Janet's fault because she made me force go through these slides fast. I couldn't find a really good Achilles slide. But it's basically where the thumb is on the back side. Yeah, yeah. So it go, the Achilles tendon goes up your leg, and then the calf muscle. Uh, I'm sorry. It's. Good point, because it's not a great slide. Your weak link in your chain. So the weak link in your chain. That's Most people with Achilles ruptures never hurt in their Achilles. They go and snap. It's done. And uh, if you're, a, again, a basketball fan, Kobe Bryant did it when he played against the Giants. Harrison Barnes was following him around a pick, and Kobe looked up at him from the ground and said, did you just kick me? Because <laughs> that's how it felt. And, 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 and he knew exactly what it was when, when Harrison Barnes said, no, I didn't. <laughs> he knew he had torn it. And that's what I, I, I would say. I, I can't remember one person. I'm sure I have one person who, who had some Achilles symptoms before they tore it. But most of them, I always ask it because it's such a thing. Did you ever feel your Achilles? I said, no, I thought my Achilles was fine. Um, shin splints is pain in your shins, and, and really there's exercises to do for the shins, but the big thing to know is that a lot of times it can be a stress fracture going on. And again, if you have shin splints, you can treat it the way YouTube tells you to treat it, but but also think deeper. And that, I, I just don't see that in the literature. Uh, they don't, uh, shin splints, you do this, but I never see, oh, get an x-ray, get your bone density, get, get, get your vitamin D level. So that's real important. Um, shin splints, if you run cross country, 
everybody has shin splints in September, and only <coughs> only 10% of the team still has shin splints in October because shin splints are produced by a violent increase in, in running, a, a change in activity. So you start to get, so the, the shin muscles start pulling really hard. And, uh, and really, if you want to do things safely, you have to increase your exercises 10% a week. So, and what cross country, what, most kids don't run during the summer and they go from not running to 10 miles a day in September. Okay, is that 10% a week increase? No. <laughs> and so they get shin splints. Okay. So, but for most injuries, if you're like, if you walk 9,000 steps a day, good for you, and you want to increase it, you want to go to 9,900 steps. You want to do 10%. If you're doing 10 minutes on exercise bike, you want to do 11 and 12. It's a slow process, but if you want to do it safely, you bump up 10%. You know, some people will say 15, but I'll, I'll go with 10. Uh, and the, here, I use this. Um, this is uh, uh, very age discriminatory, but I, I look at that. He's grabbing, he's grabbing his leg. The tennis coach says, I'm sending a patient in who has shin splints. I say, boy, let's, let's get a bone density. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I worry about, you know, his bone. When you get past 80, you have poor bones by definition. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can still keep your muscles really strong, and the muscles protect your bones. So you can still help yourself, uh, but just by definition, yes? Yes. Yeah, osteopenia is a little weakening, and osteoporosis would be a, a more severe. Okay. Right. Right, yeah, so get your bone density. So, And then I'm just going to end with which ri Richard's story. So somebody comes in with leg swelling, calf pain, um, and, and even a history. It's sometimes it's uh, leg cramps. So if you have leg cramps, and I tell people, okay, where do you get them? And they say, oh, calf. Well, learn to stretch your calf, stretch your hamstrings. It's your hamstring. But if it's not going away, Get get a Doppler ultrasound and see if see if you have, um, you know, a a thrombitis in, in the legs, um, and then there's that that definitely will save your life if you if you didn't know you had some sort of blood clot developing. It couldn't be just just a, a little one that gets bad overnight. So thank you very much for <laughs> for uh, staying awake for an hour and a half. <laughs> You are the best. <laughs>